Hi, my name is Jennifer Rothman. I'm a pediatric hematologist at Duke University Children's Health Center, and I'm here to speak to you today about pyruvate kinase deficiency. Pyruvate kinase deficiency is a rare genetic disorder that affects the health of red blood cells. This educational program is sponsored by AGOS, and I'm presenting on behalf of the company. The information shared in this program is not intended as medical advice, and for any medical or treatment-related questions, please talk to your primary providers and your healthcare team. I have been paid by AGOS to participate in this webinar. The learning objectives of this talk are to hopefully introduce you to a better understanding of what pyruvate kinase deficiency is, what causes pyruvate kinase and who can be affected by this disorder, the spectrum of symptoms as well as the complications that may be seen in pyruvate kinase deficiency and the impact of pyruvate kinase deficiency on the overall health and well-being of individuals. The red blood cell has an important role in our body and system. It is responsible for carrying oxygen throughout our body and delivering oxygen to the tissues that need it. Hemoglobin is a protein within the red blood cells that carries oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the tissues. Pyruvate kinase deficiency affects red blood cells by preventing them from doing their job. Red blood cells make energy by converting glucose, which is a sugar, into ATP, which is a, a molecule of energy. The enzyme pyruvate kinase is needed to convert that glucose to energy. In general, healthy red blood cells have enough ATP or energy made by this enzyme to survive the trip uh, and deliver oxygen throughout the body. But when you have pyruvate kinase deficiency or not enough pyruvate kinase enzyme, those red blood cells do not have enough energy to do the job and as a result, break apart more quickly. When red blood cells break down, we call that hemolysis. Um, and when those cells break down, they also are gonna lose hemoglobin and, and low number of red blood cells is what we know as anemia. If red cells die faster than they're able to be made, that is called a chronic hemolytic anemia. In general, an average red blood cell will last 120 days, so roughly three to four months to do their job. But with pyruvate kinase deficiency, some of these cells are only lasting several days to weeks. So you can imagine there's a huge amount of energy uh, to just replace all the cells that are being lost. Uh, and additionally, why uh, people have uh, anemia because they just can't keep up and make the number of cells they need. And this constant process or frequent red cell break breakdown is the reason that many patients have uh, symptoms associated with pyruvate kinase deficiency. Pyruvate kinase deficiency is inherited in, in a way that we call autosomal recessive. We know that genes, especially the PKLR gene, really are the instructions that our body has in order to make proteins like pyruvate kinase enzyme. We each inherit one copy of this gene from each parent. Um, and in order to have the disease, you need both copies to be abnormal or to have a variation. That's what we mean by autosomal recessive. Two copies have to be abnormal in order to have the disease. Most people will inherit two different variations from their parent, but in some populations, um, you may inherit the same difference. Um, and uh, that would be kind of what we call a homozygous uh, mutation. But typically we, if you hear the words the doctors use, we call this compound heterozygous or two different mutations inherited from mom and dad. So in order to have pyruvate kinase deficiency, your parents would be carriers, meaning they would have one normal gene and one variant gene. And they can pass that on to their children. Each child has a one in four chance of having the pyruvate kinase deficiency. We often look at pictures like this and assume that if you had four children, you'll have one affected child, two carriers, and one unaffected child. But we know that's not actually true. And it's important to know that if parents are carriers, they have a one in four chance for each individual child to have pyruvate kinase deficiency. I've unfortunately met families who thought that they had one child with PKD and therefore the other three were less likely to be affected. That's not true. Each individual child has a 25% chance. And that also means that 50% of the children are gonna be carriers. It's also really important for parents to wonder if they have pyruvate kinase deficiency, are their children gonna definitely have it? Well, in general, it's unlikely if you are uh, living in the general population. Because pyruvate kinase deficiency is so rare that most people are not carriers. 
this is again important to know if you're part of the general population. There are some small cohorts of communities for which pyruvate kinase is higher in frequency. And in that case, you may meet somebody who is also a carrier. And it's important to talk about that in case you want genetic counseling. But in general, most partners are not going to be carriers, are not going to be effective. Therefore, if somebody who has two genes meet abnormal variants, meaning somebody affected with pyruvate kinase, they're going to pass one variant gene to their children and their partner will pass one normal gene. Therefore, the most likely scenario is that all of your children will be carriers, but none of the children will be affected. It is important that though anybody with a significant blood disorder participate in genetic counseling and family planning prior to getting pregnant so that you know what the risk both to yourself and your health are, as well as to the risk to your offspring. Signs and symptoms of pyruvate kinase deficiency are really variable, and it often depends on what age you are when they present. I'm a pediatrician, so I typically see patients who present in early childhood. Um, parents who are on this call may know that, that babies who are born with pyruvate kinase deficiency may have severe jaundice. They may need lights in the, uh, in the neonatal period. They need, may need something like an exchange transfusion. They could have severe anemia and need blood transfusions early in life. Sometimes the disease isn't as, as severe. You don't present in the immediately in childhood, but maybe as the kids are growing, what you might find is that children have a little bit more jaundice with illness. They're anemic, meaning they have low blood counts. Maybe they're having trouble keeping up with their peers in, in exercise. They could start to develop a larger spleen, look um, yellow when they get sick. Um, as you age, common symptoms can, can vary, again, depending on where you are in life. You may be more symptomatic during puberty, during pregnancy, and as you get older, you may have more symptoms associated um, with, with the anemia. And that can include fatigue, shortness of breath with exercise, a propensity to get headaches, abdominal pain, um, either from a big spleen or gallstones. Sometimes people who are anemic have, dif have difficulty concentrating, and you can get um, bone pain associated with some of the changes that can be seen with high red cell turnover or um, something that we'll later talk about called iron overload. It's important to know that hemolysis can actually affect the body in several different ways. The first way, as we talked about, is by being anemic. When your cell number is not as high, you're not carrying as much oxygen to your body as you need. If your oxygen isn't going to your lungs, your heart, your brain, you may feel tired, fatigued, you may get headaches, get short of breath with exercise, um, not be able to keep up with peers in exercise or sports, and you may have cognitive difficulties, meaning that you may feel a little foggy, have a harder time with memory or concentration. An aplastic crisis is a specific event in which your bone marrow is unable to make red cells quickly enough and compensate, and you can have very, very low blood counts. That typically occurs in the setting of a virus, and the most common virus that causes that is the parvovirus. You also have symptoms when the red cells break down quickly. When those red cells die and burst apart, they release bilirubin into the bloodstream. That bilirubin is what you may know of as causing yellowing of your skin, yellowing of your eyes. And those bilirubin um, kind of is like a sludge that goes in your gallbladder, which is a little bag that sits under your liver. And when that sludge builds up, it can make gallstones. If those gallstones get stuck, they can cause a lot of pain um, and discomfort, even you know, nausea or vomiting after eating fatty foods. Or if a stone really gets stuck in there and gets infected, you can get acute cholecystitis and have a medical emergency related to that. Again, the, the hemolytic blood cells are abnormal. They are um, more fragile. And so our spleen um, can also get enlarged when you have this problem. The spleen I like to describe as sort of, it's a big bag of blood that serves as a filter and it lives under your rib cage on the left-hand side. And its job is to have all the blood move through it and filter out all the old and damaged blood cells. You can imagine if you have a primary blood disorder that that's working overtime, it gets really big. And sometimes the spleen can get very large and cause pain or discomfort and we call that splenomegaly. But other times if the spleen is working really hard to remove the abnormal cells, they may inadvertently um, break up some of the normal cells that you need or trap healthy cells in there. And so you be, can become even more anemic than you might have been if your spleen um, wasn't working over time. Something away. When your body is working really hard to make, um, make blood cells and, and your body thinks it's anemic, um, sometimes you can be a little bit confused. Um, what can happen is that um, the most common reason for people to be anemic is to have low iron or be iron deficient. 
And so when your body senses severe anemia or senses that you're not able to make red cells normally, it kind of tricks itself into thinking that you're not you don't have enough iron. And so it turns its iron absorption processes on and can actually start to absorb iron from your diet at a much more effective rate. Because humans are not usually, uh, you know, we're programmed to have periods of, of drought, of having low food, of, of having starvation. We really have an efficient way of getting iron into our system, but we have a terrible way of getting iron out of our system, meaning we don't know how to do that at all. And so anytime iron comes into our system, either absorbed from our diet or from blood transfusions, which is a really important source of iron in people with anemia uh, and chronic hemolytic anemia, we can start to have that iron build up. A little bit of iron, as you can imagine, is good because it's an important part of blood cells, but when you have too much, it doesn't have anywhere to go and it can sit in the liver. If it sits in the liver too long, uh, it can cause scarring and damage and irritation to your liver that can cause a, cause a problem. And so, as I really talked about, because of the prolonged anemia, the inefficiency in which we make blood cells, patients who are not on transfusions can become iron overloaded just because the body absorbs iron too, too well. And the complications of iron overload can really vary depending on what, where the iron is sitting. The most important thing that we worry about is iron overload in the liver, and that can cause liver irritation and scarring. Uh, if, it, if it loads into the heart too much, it can make your heart have um, abnormal uh, heart rates, um, uh, cause heart failure, or high blood pressure in the lungs called pulmonary hypertension. It can affect our endocrine system in terms of how we use our bone minerals and um, our blood sugars and cause low bone density and other endocrine problems. It's important that if you have pyruvate kinase deficiency, even if you're not frequently getting transfusions to know that this is a potential risk so that your doctor can monitor for iron overload over time. The simplest way to do that is to monitor a blood test called a serum ferritin. And it's recommended that you have that monitor at least once a year, but potentially more uh, if you're on chronic transfusions or if your iron levels are so high that you potentially need a medicine to help uh, get rid of iron. If the ferritin levels continue to rise somewhere between 500 to 1,000, it's really important to escalate the observation and do something more um, to really monitor uh, the iron level that's in your body. And we typically recommend using an MRI to uh, monitor your liver iron um, as opposed to doing a liver biopsy. So it's something that's non-invasive, it's non-painful, and it gives you a good accurate uh, assessment of how much uh, iron you're having in your body. It's important to know that iron overload can happen at any age, and we can see it at, at um, at any hemoglobin level. So you do wanna be checking for that. Right now, there are not very many medic uh, medications or other ways to manage symptoms of pyruvate kinase deficiency. Um, most of them are supportive in nature. Many people use um, a vitamin called folic acid to help with uh, one of the building blocks of red blood cells. But it's okay if you're also not on folic acid in the U and you live in the U.S. In the U.S., uh, our U.S. Um, DA supplements many, many foods, including uh, grain, rice, uh, bread, cereals with additional folic acid. So if you eat a typical American diet, you will get folic acid in your diet. And, and so whether or not you're on an additional folic acid supplement um, should be discussed with your doctor. Other ways that we, we can manage um, symptoms of pyruvate kinase deficiency are blood transfusions. So some individuals are on blood transfusions chronically, meaning you're getting them approximately one to, uh, once every one to two months in order to keep a hemoglobin level higher so that you can maintain energy. Um, we do this for kids so that they can maintain growth and development. Sometimes you need uh, transfusions just as needed. So during periods of illness, when your blood count may drop, uh, you may need a transfusion periodically. And some individuals don't have transfusions at all because their blood counts are high enough or they feel well enough um, with the hemoglobin that they have at a, at a baseline. The other uh, therapy that's very common in pyruvate kinase deficiency is splenectomy. And so we talked a lot about how the spleen really filters the blood and it can grow and expand over time. If the spleen becomes very enlarged um, and causes pain or discomfort or traps a lot of the blood in there, then sometimes it's recommended to take that spleen out in order to have those blood cells um, stay in the circulation a little longer and potentially slow down the destruction of those cells. Additionally, if the spleen is really large, it traps healthy blood cells in there too, and um, it may help bring your baseline hemoglobin up. 
Unfortunately, the, a splenectomy may, may help initially with increasing the blood count, which is really, really important. But we do know that there are risks to a splenectomy, and that can include an increased risk of infection uh, and uh, an increased risk of blood clots later in life. It's really important if anybody's ever had a splenectomy to make sure that they've gotten the appropriate vaccinations to reduce your risk of bacterial infection, to take penicillin if that's what your doctor recommends in order to reduce the risk of bacterial sepsis, and to always be aware of what you're supposed to do if you have a fever. Um, the complications of pyruvate kinase deficiency and what ways we manage them, again, are going to depend on what symptoms people have. For a, a gallbladder disease, either gallstones or uh, acute cholecystitis, you can take out your gallbladder. The good news is you don't need your gallbladder all that much. Uh, it does help uh, carry some of the enzymes that help us break down and, and um, uh, take care of fatty foods. And so if your gallbladder is removed, some people have some discomfort, um, you know, gas, uh, loose, uh, greasy diarrhea after eating fatty foods, but um, having the gallbladder taken out is, is something that is not uncommon in hemolytic anemias that we see. And then uh, the management of iron overload, as we had mentioned previously, um, because our bodies don't know how to get rid of iron on their own uh, in the absence of bleeding, we do need to use medicines to help get rid of the extra iron. And those are chelation therapies. And they can come in a variety of different forms. Uh, currently in, uh, in the United States, we typically are using oral iron chelators and there's a, a few of those that are available, but some of them uh, can be either given through the IV or subcutaneously. But if you have high levels of iron, you wanna talk to your hematologist about best ways to get rid of that or to manage that so you don't cause damage to your organs over time. But you can imagine that pyruvate kinase does affect many, many more symptoms, uh, systems than just the heart, the lungs, the body. Lots of people have significant mental health challenges when they have a chronic illness, but it also uh, can be more significant if you have a chronic illness that can affect your energy level, can affect your concentration, and can make you look different uh, if you have yellow eyes or jaundice. So we, we do know in um, some uh, studies that have looked on uh, mental health concerns about individuals with pyruvate kinase disease, that there is a large amount of individuals who feel anxiety, both about their overall health um, and about their future, but as well as so low self-esteem, depression, and social, iso social isolation, because they may feel that they cannot um, keep up with their peers uh, in, in a variety of different activities. And so I am a hematologist, so I think seeing a hematologist is incredibly important. Um, we do recommend that all people with pyruvate kinase deficiency see a hematologist annually. Um, there are many adults who have stopped seeing their doctor because they feel they haven't really done much for them. And that may be true when you're a very healthy, you know, individual in your 20s. But, but unfortunately, time catches up to all of us and uh, symptoms do start to develop uh, as people age. And it's really important to have that relationship. So if a complication does come up, you have somebody to call, uh, you know what to be looking for, you keep, you're, you keep yourself educated. But there is actual monitoring that we do do in the hematology office. And that includes monitoring your blood counts, looking at your liver, your kidney, um, looking for bone health problems, iron overload, and, and continuing to you know, provide recommendations if these things are changing, as well as to keep you up to date on, um, uh, on, on the field and, and uh, keep you educated so that you know how to best advocate for your own health. There are certain things that I would consider emergencies and that you really need to make sure that you see a hematologist or in fact, potentially an emergency room if things are, um, are getting worse. And that would be, you know, certainly sudden or worsening pallor, meaning feeling pale or fatigue, uh, shortness of breath, uh, sudden jaundice or even progressive worsening of jaundice, uh, new abdominal pain, shortness of breath, difficulty climbing stairs, um, inability to lay flat, those could be signs of clots in your blood, um, which are at high risk with anybody with a hemolytic anemia, but more so if you've had a splenectomy in the past. If you've had a fever um, and you've had a splenectomy, this is a, uh, an emergency, uh, as I mentioned before, because of the risk of bacterial infection. And any new symptom that is new or unusual, you, know, you wanna make sure that it is not related to your underlying condition. And so in summary, pyruvate kinase deficiency is a rare genetic disease that does cause the red blood cells to break apart easily. And symptoms that you may, um, you may find are related to both the anemia as well as the hemolysis or the, the breakdown of those cells. Those symptoms are, can vary over time and are pretty individual, both based on your underlying blood count, um, but it's important to know that they vary over time and, um, 
and you may have different periods in life where you are more symptomatic than not, uh, or symptoms may worsen with age. Pyruvate kinase deficiency is associated with um, several known complications that do need routine monitoring, including the risk of gallstones, iron overload, low bone density, and some endocrine problems. And it's important to be following with your physicians for them. And there are common supportive treatments that include blood transfusions, potential splenectomy, or medications that may remove excess iron. It's important to know if you are either a candidate for them or if you should be taking them. And then if you are on medications like chelation, it's important to be monitored for the side effects that those chelating medicines may have. And so we strongly recommend that you work closely with your hematologist to monitor your pyruvate kinase deficiency and to find a plan that works best for you. I think that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Rothman. Um, I, like I said at the, at the beginning of the presentation, if you have any questions um, for Dr. Rothman, please enter those into the chat to the Q&A-Jacqueline. And after Molly shares her story, um, we will be asking questions to both the speakers. So feel free to send those in at any time. But thank you so much. That was a terrific overview of PK deficiency. Um, and now we're going to turn the tables to Molly, um, who it sounds like a couple of you might know, who is here to join joining us tonight to share a story, her story of living with PK deficiency. So welcome, Molly. Hello, um, I'm Molly. Uh, I know a couple of you, some, I, some of you I don't, but um, it's really nice to be here. It's really exciting and quite an honor. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, but as I said, my name is Molly. I'm 32 years old. I live in West Virginia and I live with PK deficiency. When I was born, I was rushed into intensive care immediately. My mom and dad were young. They were first time parents and they were pretty terrified. The doctors didn't know what was going on. They thought I had a heart and lung defect. I'm not really sure what conclusion they came to, but I know they painted a very dire outlook to my parents. I was officially diagnosed with BK deficiency when I was nine months old. Since the disease was so rare, my parents didn't have access to a lot of information, but they did find a hematologist who began what would become my healthcare plan of blood transfusions, medications, and regular appointments to monitor my levels. From the start, it seemed like life was gonna be different for me, but my parents being who they are, decided they were gonna raise me like, just like any other kid. The mentality was very much, it is what it is. These are the cards you've been dealt, so learn to deal with it. This approach worked really well for me because I grew up thinking I was really normal. Honestly, they did such a great job that I actually thought doctor's appointments, hospitalizations, blood draws, medications, transfusions, all of that was just a regular part of everybody's life. Now, this parenting style may seem a bit harsh, um, but it really wasn't. My parents, they're amazing people, and I'm just so grateful they didn't hold me back. They showed me what I could achieve in life while with living with a rare disease. I did well in school, um, I and I participated in many sports, um, but mainly competitive gymnastics. Looking back, I remember being really tired. Um, there was a lot of times I wasn't able to keep up in gym class or during gymnastics. And I just thought I had to work harder or maybe just I wasn't as talented as the rest of the kids. I never thought my lack of progress was linked to my PK deficiency, but now as an adult, I know that it was. Today, we know more about PK deficiency. We know that every patient presents differently, but we also know that it's possible for patients to live very satisfying lives. Currently, my husband and I live near the town I grew up in. Both of our families are nearby, which we love. Um, I work in our town parks and recreation department. And I also coach gymnastics a couple nights a week. I won't stand up here and paint a rosy portrait of my life with PK deficiency, but I'm proud of what I've accomplished thus far. Still, there are days when it's difficult to get out of bed. Simple tasks like doing laundry, taking a shower, they can be exhausting. PK deficiency is really draining. Some days at work, the brain fog is so intense that it's hard for me to concentrate. My colleagues are fully aware of my disease and how it impacts me and they're very accommodating. I'm so grateful that I'm able to take days off and I can leave early to go, you know, doctor's appointments, blood transfusions, whatever I need to do. There are some people who don't understand PK deficiency. They might say or think, well, you look fine, so what's the big deal? This is hard. 
When people want to know more about PKU deficiency, I usually keep it very simple. I just say there's an enzyme missing in my red blood cells and it causes them to break down quite rapidly. While other people's blood cells last 120 days, mine lasts anywhere from a few hours to a couple of weeks. I always explain the fact that I'm transfusion dependent and that I have iron overload that causes other issues throughout my body. I usually stop there because the list is long and with that, de that description, most people walk away with a better understanding. The seven to eight year olds that I coach um, in gymnastics, they really don't understand PK deficiency. Um, usually if I turn yellow, they'll just say, Miss Molly, are you okay? Do you have to pee again? Um, that's usually the running joke because they truly think that's what it is. I wish it was the case, it is not. Laughter is a very important part of my journey. I have to find the humor. My husband and my family and my friends are essential to this. They know how to cheer me up and they are also very understanding when I don't feel up to doing something. I'm getting better at listening to my body and saying no when I need to. That wasn't an easy road for me. When I was in my late teens and into my early 20s, I decided that I was tired of doctor's appointments, medications, chelation therapy, transfusion surgeries. I was just sick of it all. I stopped taking care of myself. I stayed up late. I didn't eat right. And as a result, my health took a nosedive. I had a pretty, pretty serious conversation with my hematologist who said, if you don't take this seriously, you're going to die. That was a turning point for me. I realized that I needed to take it seriously because my life depended on it. I also came to the realization that my health impacts more than just me. It impacts my family and my friends. Right around this time, my younger brother, Adam, was born. He's 20 years younger than me, and he lives with PK deficiency. We also have a sister, Tessa, who's 11 years younger than me, and she does not have PK deficiency, but she does carry the gene. My brother was diagnosed right at birth, and that was difficult. Of course, my family took in stride, but I was really upset. I didn't want him to have to go through the things that I went through. I began learning more about PK deficiency and I stayed on top of my appointments, listened to my doctor's advice. I graduated from college with a nursing degree and worked for about six years. Unfortunately, I had to switch careers. The exhaustion, the brain fog, the blood transfusions and the uncertainty that comes with PK deficiency didn't really go well with nursing. I was heartbroken when I had to leave my career, but I am happy in my role now as with our Parks and Recreation Department as it allows me to help people in another way. It's also where I met my husband, so I will say that worked out for me. My parents are now raising another child with PK deficiency. I have to say they've taken a slightly more relaxed approach with parenting him, but I'm glad that we know more than uh, we did when I was younger. My brother is now 12 and he loves doing typical kid stuff like playing outside, playing with friends, video games, etc. He's a lot smarter than all of us, of course. Um, it's been interesting to have someone so close to me living with PK deficiency. They'll complain about some of his symptoms, like he used to complain about um, leg pain and hip pain. And it really wasn't until he said something that I thought that could actually be related. Adam's really good at advocating for himself. He'll tell nurses when the transfusion is going too fast or he'll speak up at other times when he's uncomfortable. And I'm really proud of him for that. Self-advocacy isn't easy, but it's absolutely necessary. You have to find the right medical team. My brother and I both see a hematologist and he is great. I see him twice a year and he really acts as my primary care in a lot of ways because I go to him for, for pretty much everything. While I probably know more the, about PK deficiency than most of my healthcare team, I do have doctors that care enough uh, to learn more about this rare disease. And I think that's a good bar to set. Being here today is another important step. We are the ones who experience PK deficiency. We are the ones who live with it every day. And while you can learn a lot in a medical textbook, nobody knows us like we know ourselves. I think sharing our stories and having people who are willing to listen is huge. As I look to the future, I'm looking forward to spending more time with my husband and my family. And I'm looking forward to watching my sister and my brother grow up. My husband and I are starting uh, to think about having a family of our own. There isn't a lot of information available about pregnancy with PK deficiency, but my hematologist is working with me to see whether it might be possible. I've come to the terms um, with the fact that I may not be able to have children and I'm okay with that. I've had time to get, you know, come to terms with that, but I know that's gonna be really hard on my husband. Those of us who are living with PK um, deficiency or know someone or caring for someone to, with PK deficiency know there are so many challenges to this disease. 
not only the lifelong hardships, but also the day-to-day struggles that we just don't have the energy to do certain things. I take care of myself and I do the best I can because I know my brother is watching and I don't want to pay a dire outlook. I want him and other young people to see that it's important to find the things you love, surround yourself with good people, and take your health seriously. Also, find the right medical team, advocate for yourself as much as possible, and share your story with others. With more knowledge and information, my hope is that our level of care will continue to improve. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Molly, for sharing your personal experience. It's not always easy, um, and for all you've done as an advocate as a person living with PK deficiency and as the caregiver, as a sibling. Um, so thank you. So now we've, we've got the questions rolling in. Um, so we are gonna start the Q&A portion. So if you've got a question for either Molly or Dr. Rothman, please enter those into the chat. Um, I do want to remind you that we cannot address any questions um, about your own specific healthcare or specific treatments. Um, and that these kinds of questions really should be directed to your own personal healthcare team but we have a lot and we're gonna start with a couple for you, Dr. Rothman. Can PK deficiency be acquired or is it always hereditary? So in general, um, uh, most cases are hereditary, but there can be de novo or brand new mutations. And so it's not that it's acquired, meaning you are um, born healthy with two normal genes and um, somehow develop PK deficiency over time, but you might be the first person in your family who carries a gene variant, um, but typically you are born with the disorder. Okay, and another one for you. Are there medications that interfere with PK activity and so should be avoided? if you have this condition? There, uh, there's not anything specifically that we recommend that people avoid. Um, so no, not off the top of my head, but I know that. Okay, and I'm gonna keep going. We have, we have a few in a row for you. Um, because of the possible endocrine complications, is there an increased risk of diabetes? And also do you remit, uh, recommend that patients see an endocrinologist? Yes, yes and yes. So um, iron loading, it depends on um, where, uh, how much iron overload you have, but there is the risk of uh, loading the iron into the pancreas that can lead to uh, insulin insufficiency and diabetes. And so we do recommend that anybody who is on chronic transfusions uh, and or has iron overload should be seeing an endocrinologist to be looking for that. You should look at both your, um, uh, your, uh, your uh, sorry, your fasting blood glucose, potentially a glucose tolerance test, um, and some other markers. We look at bone health, um, uh, bone density. Um, you may look at thyroid disease and um, especially pubertal development if there's some delays in children. So yes, we absolutely think an endocrinologist is a really important member of your healthcare team. Okay, terrific, thank you. Um, Molly, you spoke a little bit about this, but um, do you have any advice for younger people living with, um, with PK deficiency? And I know you, you know, you have a sibling as well, but, um, or for their caregivers. Um, you know, I think for young people, like I said, trying to stay positive and just keep your life as normal as possible. I know there's a lot of things that can get you down. Um, you know, hospitalizations, doctor's appointments, as I quickly realized later in life that that was not a normal part of everybody's life. Um, I, I do think it's important to try to maintain that normalcy for kids as much as possible, um, but also, you know, have that compassion and understand that there's going to be times where they don't feel good or don't feel up to doing something, and that's okay, too. So finding that balance is important. That's excellent. And how do you, if someone who's not familiar with this condition asks you, you know, what is it that you have? What is PK deficiency? How do you typically describe it? Um, so, you know, pretty much I just explained that there's an enzyme missing in my red blood cells. So, um, you know, I, I oftentimes explain, you know, because people can wrap their head around the, uh, the word anemia, um, but they always think, oh, well, just take some iron. Well, mm -hmm. no, not quite. So um, I usually explain like I have anemia, but I have too much iron. So that causes other issues. So it's, it's not so much the iron deficiency, but um, I don't, you know, my red cells break down quite quickly and that's what I'm lacking. So usually that's the kind of standpoint that I try to take with that. Keep it somewhat simple, but give me- Always simple. Right, right. Um, okay, back to Dr. Rothman. Uh, how common is PK deficiency? How many people in the US have it and has the average physician seen it? So the three-pronged question. Yeah, it's really uncommon. And I am, I am not gonna be the best person to quote the absolute numbers. The real answer is we don't really know how many people in the country have pyruvate kinase deficiency because as, as many people on this call may know, it, it um, is not 
uh, not always well diagnosed. Um, a lot of people were told, especially if you're older, that you just had non-spherocytic hemolytic anemia or hemolytic anemia NOS. And so because people may not be looking specifically for pyruvate kinase, there may be a lot of people out there who have pyruvate kinase deficiency that um, are just being told that they have anemia of some other sort or, that, or they are st have stopped going to the doctor because they haven't felt it helpful um, or they don't know it. So right now we think that there are several thousand people, but there may be more and we really just don't, don't know for sure. Um, can you give me part three of the question? Yes, yes. Has the average physician then seen this? So I would, I would say in, in general, if you're talking about a primary care physician, no, probably most primary care physicians have not um, had many individuals in their practice. Um, and that's one of the reasons to think about um, having a specialist um, who does know a little bit more about it can help um, send you to the appropriate doctors. But you're also potentially hinting out, has the average hematologist seen this? And the answer then is too, is it's not all that common. I would say most hematology centers may have one, two, you know, very large center may have three or four patients with pyruvate kinase, but that's, that's pretty weird. Um, and so um, you, you should be thinking of yourself as a relatively unique and individual person at each practice. You might be one of the few patients that are being cared for there. There are a couple of handfuls of areas they talked about that may have pockets due to some you know, influence of, of genetic um, traits or uh, related to that. So there may be some areas that are a little more familiar with it, but in general, it's pretty rare. This is somewhat related um, as you talk about being a specialist in this area. How did you become interested in PK deficiency? Do you have a clinic? And finally, thank you for devoting your career to this. <laughs> well, uh, because it's so rare, my whole career is not devoted to pyruvate kinase. I, don't, uh, I think that it's important to know that, <laughs> that there are lots of general hematologists, but I, um, I became interested in um, benign hematology, so not cancer, which I think is pretty rare. A lot of hematologists do a lot of cancer medicine um, when I was in medical school and um, saw some patients uh, early on with, with uh, blood disorders, and I thought it was really interesting. And then when I was training, I took care of a little girl who had pyruvate kinase deficiency um, and uh, you know became interested in that. And so really Really, I specialize in a, a lot of different types of anemia, but typically see um, the congenital hemolytic anemias in, in the region. And I practice in North Carolina. Um, and so I see a lot of the kids in the area um, there who, who have um, blood disorders. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question for you. How does PK deficiency manifest in elderly patients? Is there different symptomology? Yeah, so we do think it's probably a little bit more significant as people get older, and, and that um, can be related to some of the changes in our physiology as we get older. All people feel a little more fatigued, a little less exercise tolerance, a little more tired and achy, um, and it's definitely compounded if you have a, a primary blood disorder or, or hemolytic anemia. And so we do think that as people age, they are, do become a little bit more symptomatic. They have less cardiovascular reserve, so they're more likely to feel fatigued. Um, we know, you know, memory, all those problems get worse as you age, you may be more symptomatic, but I do think bone health is probably another area that is extremely important as you age. Many uh, older people have more uh, osteoporosis, more fragile bones, more joint problems. This is going to be worse if you have iron overload and, and, um, and also uh, significant hemolytic anemia. So I think it, that is one of the reasons why we're really trying to emphasize that people should maintain a relationship with a doctor, it's pretty easy to feel good when you're in your 20s and maybe you don't think there's a problem, but the, but, but life and your body does catch up with you. And so it's important to continue to do that screening because um, we may be able to identify some changes in bone health early before you develop severe osteoporosis and fall and break a hip when you're young. Um, and so I do think that symptoms do worsen with this. And this is a very related question. I just want to see because there's someone very has a personal connection to this says I am 60 years old. And my question is, what can I expect as I enter my golden years in terms of energy, iron, overall overload and any long term effects? So I think you've answered a lot of it, but I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Yeah, you know, I, it's it's really hard because people, everybody is so individual and I think individualized. And so I think it depends on, you know, on your overall health and well being there. There are um you know, there are all 60 people, year old people aren't created equal, nor neither are all seven year old people. So I think the, you know, the way you want to do is to anticipate what potential changes could come and, and, and be proactive about that. So maintaining good exercise tolerance, maintaining good bone health, having people monitor your vitamin D levels, you know, doing the things that you can do to improve your function. Um, and then the more functional you are, uh, unfortunately with everything, it's, it's a use it or lose it. So really try to maintain functionality that will help keep you active and help um, reduce some of the, the, the clients that we see over time. Um, but I don't know what your golden years will look like. Hopefully they'll be wonderful. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is stay, stay active. That's the best thing you can do for yourself. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we're going to go back to Molly. 
Uh, you stated at the beginning that you knew some of the people on this chat. Is there a support group of, or some sort of online group for PK deficiency patients um, that you're aware of? Um, yeah, so there's, um, throughout the years, there's been actually several different um, social media platforms. Um, most have gone away, but um, there are social media platforms that um, patients and caregivers can connect and, and share stories and go to each other for advice. Or, you know, even if you're just having a bad day, you can um, talk to one another and, and truly connect with people that will understand you more than anyone else will. Um, so yeah, social media is biggest been the best thing for us or for me anyway. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go back to you, Dr. Rothman. Um, are there increased complications in individuals with PK deficiency when they have surgery, pregnancy, as I know Molly alluded to, to dental problems? Um, those are the three mentioned. Yeah, so um, some of those complications are going to depend on what um, what has happened previously. So um, uh, if you've had a splenectomy, there is the potential risk of, depending on what surgical procedure, um, having bacteria sort of translocate, be more likely to get bacterial infections after infection um, after procedures. So some people recommend using what we call um, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis prior to uh, really invasive work, especially sinuses around the head and neck, because there's a lot of bacteria in our sinuses and our mouth. Um, so you could have a risk if you had a splenectomy like that. Um, again, if you've had a splenectomy, you are at higher risk of having blood clots. Um, uh, being pregnant increases your risk of blood clots, so that can that can be additive in that area. Um, and uh, being pregnant can certainly uh, cause anemia. Uh, just even even people without blood disorders are more likely to have um, problems with anemia. So you can have that worsened um, during during pregnancy, and that may be why um, some individuals are put on transfusions briefly during the pregnancy to keep themselves um, healthy and also maintaining blood flow to the placenta. And then uh, general surgeries, it really kind of depends on what kind of surgery it is and um, what your underlying health is. I would say, you know, typically speaking, if I had a young child who was having their tonsils taken out, you know, I might recommend a transfusion to keep their hemoglobin a little bit higher for anesthesia, um, but that would be um, what I would mostly recommend. Otherwise, I wouldn't anticipate significant problems. However, if there was somebody older that already had um, some cardiac disease from iron overload, um, some liver issues, and there's clean out with blood clots, then yes, surgery would certainly have higher risks um, as you age. So the risk of surgery, it's a, that's a tough question because it depends on how healthy your body is um, related to that. But certainly complications from pyruvate kinase can absolutely increase your risk of, of procedural problems. All right. Thanks for that. Um, another one for you. What is the best way to diagnose diabetes if usually the A1C and I'm not gonna get this right. Fructosamine are not 100% accurate. Is yeah, you, oh well, boy, you're really tempting me whoever's doing this one. So you're right, hemoglobin A1C is not reliable in hemolytic anemia, nor if you get transfusions. Okay. It's not It's not your own blood. Um, and a hemoglobin A1C relies on a red blood cell living 120 days. And that's what it gives the amount of average amount of sugar that kind of binds to those cells. And so you have to have an average lifespan um, to have that be uh, useful. But I am not an endocrinologist and um, fructosamine is the one I was taught as sort of the bypassing one, but there actually is another new one that somebody taught me about and I will not remember that right now, um, but there is a different way, but that is a better question for an endocrinologist. And so um, you might wanna do the very basic ones. Um, uh, a couple of my patients with uh, thalassemia, so similar problems. Um, what our endocrinologists have done is just recommended um, fasting blood glucose and a glucose monitor um, at home for periodic testing, as opposed to trying to do some of those longer acting ways. So that probably is your best bet is to work with an endocrinologist and you might, you might do what we call fasting morning ones and then pre-meal um, glucose checks for a period of time and then really be able to see what your, what your glucose is doing over time. Okay. That's a really good question. And I'm going to keep you busy here. Got another. <laughs> um, are there any vitamin supplements you recommend for PK deficiency patients to specifically target bone health or reduce brain fog? I mean, uh, I, I don't, I don't usually, I mean, I don't know that we have a lot of data on supplements as one being better than others, uh, other than vitamin D and calcium. So clearly vitamin D and calcium are really important for bone health. Um, that's, that's a, that's a given. Um, other supplements, the, the hard thing is, is they're not all that well studied in a very controlled way. And so we re really don't know um, anything that I would particularly say that I would recommend above anything else. Okay. This has been great. This has been lots and lots of questions. So um, if for any reason we did not get to your questions today, we're gonna move on to the next part of our program. Um, again, just best to check with your own healthcare team. 
But um, thank you both Molly and Dr. Roth, and this has been a fantastic 45 minutes with lots of information and great insight. So with that, I'm going to now um, turn to Elizabeth um, from Agios, who is part of the recently launched My Agios Patient Services Group. And I'm gonna let her take it from here just to, to share a bit of an update with you. Thanks. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight to introduce to you My Agios, which is the recently launched patient support program for patients living with PK deficiency and their caregivers. Um, I just wanted to quickly thank Dr. Rothman and Molly for giving your informative and personal presentations. They're both really great. Um, but I just wanna take a couple minutes to tell you a little bit about this program, give you in some information about my clinical background and then go through the steps to enroll in the program. Um, so My Agios is a patient support program that connects you to a dedicated patient support manager with a clinical background to help provide education navigate the unique challenges, and to help you to feel empowered in managing rare disease. And um, there's really three areas that we focus on. Um, as Dr. Rothman and Molly both explained, everyone's experience with this disease is really different. So our goal is to be flexible to meet your needs. Um, and that includes the material and topics that we cover, but also like the time of day that we connect and how often we talk. Um, but we're dedicated to providing customized education that works best to support you and your lifestyle. So secondly, here we have educational resources, and we know that everyone's at a different place in their journey. So whether you're newly diagnosed or you've been living with PK deficiency for a lifetime, we want to provide tailor tailored support and resources to help you better understand your disease and also to communicate effectively with your healthcare team. Um, there's a wide array of um, resources available. There's helpful, helpful brochures. We have a really great welcome packet that we send out after enrollment. Um, we can also walk through different websites one-on-one -on -one with you over the phone, um, and we can email these resources or we can mail them to you. So again, just trying to um, meet each unique patient's needs. Um, and then finally, community connection. So tonight's webinar is just one example of the fantastic opportunities that Agios has developed. Um, your patient support manager will continue to share different opportunities and events as they're developed. Um, living with a rare disease can be really isolating, and many patients feel that connecting with other patients and caregivers, sharing your own experience, and learning through your community can be really rewarding um, in helping you through your journey. So we can go to the next slide here. So these are the two patient support managers, uh, myself and Nafar, and we're both registered nurses. Um, I've been a nurse for over 15 years. Um, I've most recently supported patients with rare blood disorders as a nurse case manager in the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, I do live in Connecticut with four busy kids and several pets who I think wanted to make an appearance in tonight's webinar, so <laughs> glad that they're quiet now. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight here at the bottom um, to enroll in the PK deficiency support program. You can go to this website right here, so you could even copy and paste that. Um, but I'm sure you all know the PK deficiency website also, um, it's called No PKD. So I'm just going to take over sharing for a moment so that I can kind of walk through the steps to enroll. All right, so this is the No PK deficiency website. If you haven't been on it, it's a fantastic resource. Um, and to, to find the My Agio site from here, you'd go up to Helpful Tools and then just go down to My Agios. And this gives pretty much the information that we talked about tonight. Um, and our phone number is there. And then to enroll in the program, you just click on that button. And then this is the form. So just ask, ask a couple questions. You just fill in the blanks, check the boxes. Um, and then once you hit submit, this information goes directly to myself and Nafar. Um, and really depending on where you live in the country will we'll, you know, determine who calls you back. But it's, it's always gonna be one of us um, and we stay with you through your journey. So even if you just have questions about the program prior to enrolling, our phone number is right there on that slide. If you can pull the slide back up, um, the 800 number. And you can also email us at patientsupport at agios.com. And that again goes directly to Nafar and I. So. You know, we're here, I think our hours are right there between eight and six. So if you were to enroll at night, we would give you a call the next day um, and send you out the great resources and, and you know, hopefully get to know you a little bit. So 
don't know if there's any questions about the patient support program. I don't currently see any coming in, um, but that was a lot of great information. And I think folks now know they can go to the No PK Deficiency website for more, but that's great. It's a terrific resource and we do encourage you all to, to look into it. All right, excellent. Um, so now, before we get into the breakout rooms, um, we'd like to do just a very quick survey. This will take no more than two minutes, um, but it's five brief questions that we would appreciate you answering right here on the screen. Um, as you know, our goal is to provide programs that are meaningful, um, and we use this information that you provide here to inform future programs. So we would greatly appreciate if you could take just a few minutes for your feedback, and please know that all responses recorded are, are anonymous but again, would really provide your feedback. So just five questions. The first is, do you plan on discussing or sharing any of the information provided today with your healthcare team? The next is, to what extent was the level of information shared during today's presentation? Too basic, just right, too complicated. And then I'll just let you read the next two. One is um, talking about Dr. Rothman and, and her presentation. The fourth about Molly's story. And finally, um, whether you would recommend or how likely you would be to recommend this program to others in the, in the PK deficiency community as, as Agios does, does um, plan to run more of these. Actually, I do have one question while everyone's finishing this up for you, Elizabeth. Um, and that is, is there a cost to enroll in my Agios? Um. I can't stop the video, start restart my video, but um, I hope you can hear me okay. So the program is completely complimentary. Excellent. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks for that. And thanks everyone up, there you are. And thanks everyone um, for your responses. So what we're gonna do now um, is, is provide you with the opportunity. Some of you may be familiar with breakout rooms in Zoom. Um, but you'll be able to break into, we're going to break into two groups, um, fairly random in terms of how we, we select those, but you'll be able to have your cameras on, your audio on, um, and each member or each group will also um, include one of our team from the PX group. Um, these sessions are not recorded. Um, we'll have the rooms open for about 25 minutes, and we encourage you to use this time to get to know each other and to discuss topics of uh, mutual interest. There's just a few guidelines I want to review before we, we move into those groups. Um, one is that you do not talk at all about specific treatments you may currently be on or have been on in the past. Um, we also ask that you don't mention your specific healthcare professional by name or their institution. Um, but we do encourage you to discuss topics that were brought up in today's presentation. So I, I know we're all looking forward to the time when we can you know, possibly host these meetings in person and we know, but we know for now, these still are, are remaining virtual. So we hope that these breakout rooms will provide you with the opportunity to connect with uh, others in the uh, PK deficiency community. So with that, um, there, actually I'm gonna, and I'm gonna answer one more question before we do those breakout rooms, which is since this presentation has been recorded, will it be available to watch again? And the response is yes, probably not immediately tomorrow, um, but we will be, or this, this recording will be posted to the No PK Deficiency website. I um, mean, if you have opted in for emails from Agios, which I believe many of you did during the registration process, you will be um, alerted as to when that, that is up. So with that, uh, we're gonna take, there'll be a brief pause. Um, your screen um, will, will take this piece down and then you will be taken to the other side into the breakout rooms um, and you'll see either me um, or my colleague, Chelsea. Uh, and we'll be able to all be in there together and provide you with that opportunity um, to connect. And then we'll come back briefly um, and, and close tonight's session. So, and there's Chelsea. So we look, one of us will see you on the other side in the breakout rooms. And thanks very much again. I'll, I'll thank them at the end, but to Molly and to Dr. Rothman and to Elizabeth for their presentations. See you soon. Awesome, I think we're all back in. It's miraculous how that happens. Um, so I just want to thank you all um, for attending. I think this was a really wonderful session. We had some great presentations. I want to thank Dr. Rothman, Molly, um, and Elizabeth again for, for sharing some great information. Um, and if you enjoyed today's webinar and you'd like to see others offered by Agios, you can check back to nopkdeficiency.com backslash patient 
dash programs. Um, it's the same URL many of you probably use to register for tonight. Um, and for more resources, you can also visit that website, nopkdeficiency.com. So thank you all for taking the time to join this webinar. Um, and again, to our speakers, we're thankful for them um, for taking the time to share uh, their knowledge about this topic. And that is, that is it for this evening. Thanks so much for your participation. And we look forward to seeing you again at another program uh, this fall. Thanks very much and have a great evening. Take care.